of appreciation. Thank you so much, ma'am, for doing the honors. And uh, the proceeds now to Ms. Madhu Sharma. She'll be calling rest of the speakers. She'll be inviting them. Let's not be stingy with our claps, should we? Oh, good. That's better. Thank you so much. Mike. Uh, Mike, DJ, please. Good, af <coughs> good afternoon to one and all. It's a privilege and honor for me to be here and uh, chairing this session for this discussion on beyond, it is beyond yesterday's classrooms. Now much of what has happened and in the discussion in the morning about how Singapore has the number one position in PISA results and how they've advanced and how education has tackled the uh, problem of an upcoming ongoing Say, um, country which has taken it from illiteracy to one of the foremost countries in the world today. And I have this honor to talk t to them, two people, very distinguished, and uh, talk to them about, it starts from the classroom. So the, dis the panel discussion just now is beyond yesterday's classroom. So for my first guest today is uh, Mrs. Uh, Nirmala Durai, Director, Singapore Eduatrix. I, Ma'am, I welcome you to the stage. She has a very distinguished set of, uh, I mean, introduction, and uh, it's so long, and so I was having difficulty in finding what to say and what to omit. But I would say that she's a director, Singapore Edumatrix, certified Kagan trainer, certified John Maxwell leadership coach and trainer, advanced certification for training and assessment Singapore. And the topic, <coughs> her topic is, Transforming Assessments for Self-Directed Learners. It's a very challenging topic, particularly when we look at it, assessments, and when we think about self-directed uh, self -directed learners, I think it's a challenge for students when you think about the student not have, I mean, and how does the teacher work? There are so many questions related to that, and how does one motivate oneself? and she has the owners, and many, many things I'm sure to share with us. Ma'am, we are honored to have you with us, and Thank I hand you. over the mic to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I shall keep this mic here, so that sometimes I'll just walk out the podium. Am I clear? Okay. Really? So I'm glad to say that I'm also from Singapore Edumetrics, and we are both Kagan certified trainers, so it's, we are normally very energetic and move around, but being, this being such a serious topic, I felt that I could have to give respect to it and stay put. And I'd like to say a very good afternoon to all the educators. It is a pleasure to be in Lucknow, and even greater pleasure to be here talking to you all about Singapore education. 
And my topic is on transforming assessment for self-directed learners in Singapore. Thank you so much. Okay. Oopsie. Let me apologize for that. All right. So the question is transform assessment. Why? Why do we need to do that? And self-directed learners, what for? Why do we need Singapore needs? to transform its education to create self-directed learners. The reason is to prepare, a young, to prepare young Singaporeans for to be future ready. And we found that you'll be wondering, hello, everybody would want to have a future ready uh, citizen. They want them to. But what's so special about Singapore? Singapore is unique because we are such a we are a very small nation. And if you look at the map, can you see Singapore? It's just that little dot down there. And that little dot is actually blocking Singapore. Singapore is that small. There are some immutable re re realities too that you cannot avoid. And basically, we have no national risk. We have no natural resources, and apart from our people, we only have our people, and we really have to make sure our people are able to deliver. And we have a diverse and changing population. Due to that, our economy has to stay open, and it's thus vulnerable to external influences. Anything that happens to China and USA, it affects Singapore. Anything that happens to India, it may also affect Singapore. But this is not the same for India. Anything happens to India, India is so self-sufficient in terms of resources, in terms of land, and in terms of people. And it's not the same in Singapore. So that's why in Singapore, if anything happens to the outside world, we have a domino effect. So it's so important to prepare our, Sing our Singaporeans to be future ready. That is, our students need to be resilient. They have to be adaptable and they have to be also global in their outlook. This is crucial for Singapore. And earlier on, even John was saying about WOCA, WUCA, the 21st century workplace, the complications of the landscape, the challenges that happens. Our young Singaporeans have to be resilient to that. And I'm sure it's also to the Indians in India. It's so important. And because of that, there's so much stress due to globalization. There is also technology changing the nature of work. And earlier on, one of the participants asked, why is technology? Do you know that technology is moving so fast that what you learn today expires tomorrow? So is that crucial? So you have to take what is important of technology that you can use it for assessment of learning. This actually leads to uncertainty and anxiety. So we'll be wondering, how are we preparing our students to be future ready? How are the teachers doing it? How are the, the leaders doing it? How is our Ministry of Education doing it? 
to prepare them. That's when the government decided Singapore needs to do some changes. And they decided that Singapore's education system is going through a major restructure. I tell you, it's really major. They are taking bold steps because they say certain things cannot happen and we are going to take bold steps. We are going to train the teachers and we are going to go forward with it. All right? Even though everybody said pizza, we are right on top. But we still feel we have to do something. And everybody's talking about PISA, and we have been the program for international student assessment. It's a worldwide study, and it measures 15 year old pupils' holistic performance in maths, science, and reading. And it provides, this is the most important point, it doesn't help if the government does not take action on this. This is what the Singapore government paid a lot of attention to, provide comparable data to help countries improve their education policies and outcome. And I can see that happening in this school. I was very amazed when I walked through the doors. I'm very amazed with the Gandhi family. And I can see that happening, there is progression all the way. So, if you look, let me just take one of the score, the science score. And if you can see the science score, if you look at Singapore here, let me make it big, girl, all right? This is Singapore, and we are also we are above even the OECD average, we are above it. And if you look at Finland, which is here, are you all able to see that? That's Finland, you can see Japan, and where is USA? Voila, it's here. So this was done in 2015, they do it every three years. So the next piece that's going to come out, going to be released, it's going to be in December this year, but the survey was done in 2018. All right? Actually, is this better when I talk this way, or this is okay? Is it okay? This is okay? This is better? Wow. Well, this is better. Thank you. That's getting instant feedback. That's how you do it in class, to get instant feedback, and you modulate your lesson according to that. That is called instant teaching, instant, uh, what do you say, wanting to do to make sure that the child learns. So my voice not being clear, if I don't modulate it, and if I'm a teacher who's talking in such a way that as long as I teach, I don't care. I've done the teaching, but the question you've got to ask is, have they learned? And they have to answer that, right? So, one thing the Singapore government does is, when it gets data, authentic data, they scrutinize it. They study it. They look at every aspect of it. And this is what they did. They didn't let it go. They felt, even though our students get the best PISA score, it doesn't mean that if you're the best, you're the best in everything. It really doesn't mean that. But we are happy still we are the best at this moment, okay? But so what they did is that they took the total, if you can see at the bottom here, they took the total learning time in hours per week, and they took the score, they took the score and divided it with the total learning time per week, and came with a normalized figure. And they found that Singapore had 51 hours of um, learning time for each kid per week, 51 hours. And then we are at the top. But they also say it doesn't mean that if you have more learning time that you will perform better. So they went and did a survey to check Finland and other countries. Finland is not so far away. 
Japan, if you look at Japan here, is also not so far away. And some countries that are above the line, they're not so far away from the good, according to PISA, the good score. So, they felt that, why should our Singapore kids spend so much learning time and effort, just unnecessary effort, to get a score like that? Why can't we be like Finland, putting only 37 hours per week? Japan, which we know they are, they are so academically inclined as well, and study, 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 everything is there. And Japan, we even beat Japan in terms of hours. That means our kids in Singapore have no life. So getting the top score, is it really? So when the Ministry of Education saw that, they realized, oh boy, we better do something about it. And it's so timely. And they felt that, okay, I think it's okay not to have to be at the top or be at the top, but don't have to put in so much effort in assessment, don't have to put so much effort in tuition or in repetitive work, and still give the child a life. At the same time, try to maintain where we are. So this is the direction Singapore is going. They decided that they are going to put the effort in and see where the problems are and straight away to balance it, right? But they felt that if I'm going to make changes, I have to make changes and keep what really matters. Things that we are not going to change, we are not going to change. And they are to retain our core strengths. To retain that in terms of to deliver students of sound value, to retain strong fundamentals in numeracy, literacy, as well as critical soft skills. This is a die-die must-have. And they also felt that we already have a very well-developed system. It's a very matured system. But they feel that there are areas that they can look into it to make it better. And that's what they're going to look at it to see if they can um, give the children maybe joy in learning. You know, Singapore has been talking about that. So now they are acting actively to do that. And they also felt that the changes that they make, they have to ensure education lives, uplifts lives. And this is the Singapore motto from the start. It has to up, up, uplift life. And if you know, if you are a Singapore parent, if you say Indian parents can be difficult, Singapore parents don't even think about it. Education is key, it's number one. My child must do the best. And you may have 40 children in the class. It doesn't matter because you must give the effort and importance to my child. So sometimes we have to balance parents' expectations. So we normally, when school begins, what they do is they call in the parents and tell them the ground rules, the do's and the don'ts. It does help, though the ground rules sharing with the parents. And they found out that with our matured system, there were some trade-off in education. And the trade-off was, was there was a lot of effort at rigor. That means wanting to academically very inclined compared to joy of learning. So academics was key. Academics is important. Everything is based on academics, so the scale tipped down. So now the governments felt that they had to do something here to balance it up. So now they want to balance as far as possible, rigor and joy. But they are saying rigor is important. A bit of stress is important. You must feel it to want to achieve a goal. So some rigor is important, but it shouldn't be too much. 
So now the government has gone in. So with the government's help, I, the system will always be better because we have support from leaders. If leadership fails, because I'm a John Maxwell coach and trainer, if leadership fails, everything fails, even how hard you try. You can be one teacher who wants to make a difference, but if leadership fails and the leader is not able to embrace all the teachers, everything collapses. All right? So in this case, we are a very compliant society. We believe, and teachers are top earners, as what John said, in Singapore. They're very well paid. And they found that for the teaching and learning track, there are three important components. They are curriculum and content. The other component is pedagogy and assessment. They found that the weightage was very high on assessment. Students having to sit for exam, 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 and mid-year exam, end of the year exam, worse, in between exam, a pre-mid-year exam, and they are preparing them and making them to retest and re, so that they produce results for the exams. Because school name is also important to some organizations. So based on this, this is the current system, school-based assessment system that we have now. If you look at the bottom here, where there is P1, P2, P3, I think in India it's also the same, right? Primary school to secondary. And we are going from primary one all the way to primary six, sitting for a major exam. And this exam decides which secondary school you go to the best or whatever. And secondary school is from sec one to sec four. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that mid-year exams, almost all the time, only for primary one and primary two, for primary ones and primary two, there are no mid-year exams. Primary one has no assessment at all. And they did a survey with the primary one and primary two, and they found that, hey, the kids are happy, and in fact, are learning and doing well. And they seem to have a joy for learning. So maybe that's the direction to go, because they find that teachers are spending, because of assessment, teachers are spending so much time on assessment that they, teaching and learning is compromised. They have to sit, for media, they have to prepare a media paper, they have to audit it, they have to review it, they have to go through a committee, and they have to make sure that the questions are correct. Finally, the student sits for it. After the student sits for it, the teacher marks it. After the teacher marks it, there's recording. All these are done by teachers. So the poor teacher, not only is she a teacher, but she's also doing administrative work, which never ends. So the Ministry of Education decided we have to take bold steps to move forward. And of course, the year-end exam, they are leaving it because there must be some assessment. It cannot be a system with no assessment. Everything grows wild. And we will, not only PISA will go down, everything else will go down. So, but this is a system that the government is monitoring. And what they did, which is a very big bold step, was to reduce assessment for P3s, primary five, prime sec one, and sec three. And this big bold step, the teachers are told that teaching and learning takes place here, yeah? and how the school wants to use this free time to release the teacher of three weeks. At least, I think if I'm not wrong, it's 25% of free time per year for, for the teachers that they can spend time with that class doing project work or other things to make the, uh, learning fun. So based on this, one thing I must say that when we do something, we are not very quick in doing something. We take our time. We do it step by step. 
So Singapore is going currently in the first phase in from 2019. They are going to the next phase. But if you can see, it's all planned. So 2019 and then from 2020 to 2021, just in case something cocks up or something goes wrong and they feel they need to balance it up, they would do it. So this is just based on assessment, how the thing, they are going to reduce the assessment to free the time for the teachers to do more important things. Apart from that, another trade-off that they found was actually paper qualification. Singaporeans are very paper oriented. They want the qualification, they want the degree. If you throw a stone in a crowd, I tell you, the people around that stone are all graduates. It's a very high level of pressure that the kids, the kids want it, the, ch the parents want it. And now it's no more just getting a degree. They want to go higher and higher. And so the government felt balance it with skill. The government is saying, please, we are not telling you not to have paper qualification. We still want you to have the qualification. But we want it balanced with skill because in the 21st century, skills are important. So that they, will, they, ha they have started a program called Skill Future Singapore. Every citizen has to go through it where you want to you are given money to go and study something that help you at your job. And they pay everything for it. So this is something that they have introduced in Singapore and they want to bring it to the young as well. So they want them to start at a young age to be skillful in whatever job they do. So let me just share the changes in the education phase, the phases. Important milestones, okay? They developed the thinking schools and thinking nations because they wanted the young Singaporeans to be able to think, think strategically, think in 1997. After that, we went to teach less, learn more, and that was in 2005. And they cut curriculum 20%. After that, they even cut it further in a few years later. But this round, they said, we are not cutting curriculum because if we cut curriculum, it becomes under teaching. So they didn't want to do that. And if you see, Thinking Schools Learning Asian was a systemic approach. That means it was a national approach. It was the whole of Singapore. Whereas for, te for teaching less and learning more, they wanted to free the teachers to put in pedagogy in their class, to put in active learning. So they wanted to free the teacher. But for 2017, they changed their mindset and say, no, from now on, it's student perspective. Because we are dealing, our students are children from the Z generation and the alpha generation. They are a whole new bunch of kids. They have different characteristics from the baby boomer like Mrs. Das and people who, and they have the uh, Y generation. But we are talking about the alpha and the uh, uh, alpha and as well as the Z generation. Why we are talking about them? For these kids, they only learn if they can learn with another. They are only good learners when they have collaborative work. So if you notice, even in the handphone, they must collaborate with somebody. They cannot be alone. So they are a different group of people. And the books that come today and the teachers, they, they are like, we were talking about, uh, what do you say, uh, about digital world. The kids today, are born and given a handphone at a very young age where they can use the iPad and look at movies and do look at pictures and all that. So the kids of this generation, are, they can get instant feedback from their handphone. So when the teacher who's teaching in class, if you don't put collaborative strategies in your class, the teacher, the sad thing is that the student can't flick you off. 
They want you, we can't get the teacher to fly in, run in, and disappear, just like how the iPhone, the things that, the iPad, the, the so-called, uh, uh, what do you say, the apps that they have. So the teacher has to be interactive. The teacher has to take uh, responsibility to make sure that when she goes in and teach and the student leaves the classroom, she knows her students have learned. So, for the students' perspective, they had to bring in the joy of learning, 2017. And when joy of learning came in, it's still on. Because Singapore has not achieved it totally yet, but they are working towards it. And the other thing that they find is crucial is lifelong learning. Learn for life. That means after school, you still have to keep on learning because of technology. It expires so quickly. They want to integrate that feeling to the kids. So Mrs. Das did the STP, the, teach, the Singapore teaching practice. She did the first quadrant, the second quadrant, and the third. I'm going to do the fourth, where is assessment and feedback. And we find that the SDP is such a phenomenal uh, framework that looking at it as a teacher, you know what you have to do in class. And this is the whole cycle behind it. You have to address learning gaps and checking for understanding and providing feedback is the direction that will lead a kid to self-directed learning. So only when you do the closing of the gap, the kid will understand and say that I've learned knowledge. I'm building knowledge. So basically, Singapore has always been quite a bit on assessment of learning. We've been on rigor quite a bit where exam, 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 test, 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 and even worse, the test that they give, not only you have the mid-year exam, you have the final year exam, they also give tests, and the test scores are added to the exam. So the kids have to study again. So it's like studying, studying, studying. Whoa, this is a bit too much. So they are now, this is important. I mean, summative assessment is important. I'm not saying it's not, but there's got to be a balance. So now they're going towards assessment for learning. So that as long as you, as Ask, suppose you taught the child for 10 minutes and what you're teaching the child is so important. It's a, it's a question that will come out for the exam. It will definitely come out for the paper. Maybe this is what you should do. You should ask the student, what is the most important point that I shared the last 10 minutes? Pen it down and give it to me before you leave class. Straight away, when you have taught the child, you have got it, and from that piece of paper, you will know which kid understood your lesson and which didn't. That is instant assessment for you. And what do you do with that information? You don't just put it inside, oh dear, half of my class didn't get it, oh dear. You have to act on it. So that is assessment for learning, so that you lead the students to become self-directed learners. So the most crucial is in classrooms, we often see plenty of formative in intentions, but very little formative action. You know, I, when I go to schools and I do instructional coaching, I, find, I tell the leaders that, you know, teachers are very busy people. They have no life sometimes because they're always marking, marking, preparing for lesson and all that. So when it comes to follow up, when they know that something is not right, when they come, they collect the data, but they are so busy that they fail to do the follow up. The follow up is the action that's so crucial. And when you miss that moment, you miss the learning uh, moment for that child. And that would have made a difference to that child. I'm very passionate about making a difference in people's lives. So these are things that really affect me when I see that it doesn't happen. 
when the teacher actually has the power to do that. And teachers are great people. Without them, we won't be here today. So the most important thing is to reduce the gap. So collect the information as you mark the student's work. If the data is not acted upon, no formative work is being done. So in short, collect data, data acted upon. If you act upon the data, you are actually reducing, you are closing the achievement gap. That is, when you do form assessment for learning, there's evidence is used to adapt teaching. There is evidence. And the lesson plan are changed to meet students' learning needs. So let me share with you, uh, we have done differentiated instructions for many schools. And a lot of people who uh, call us for differentiated instruction, it's actually they already had someone coming in and teaching them differentiated instruction. But they call us back saying, can you help us? We know the theory of differentiation, but we don't know how to do it still. So we go in and teach them how to do differentiation in class. It's not easy. We have Kagan knowledge. We, and you have to be really experienced to be able to do that. But you can. Every teacher is able to do that. And life is easier for you, very much easier. Let me show you a video of a school that we went in and taught them differentiated instruction. It's an a English lesson on reading. The teacher's name is Divine, Pinebury Tree Students. All right. Thank you. A primary 3 DI lesson. Students. So just look at this teacher. Let me just lower the volume a little. So if you look at the board, the teacher has already put in her lesson plan for the students. The students are named by groups Dumbo. I don't know why they call the students Dumbo, but Dumbo, Snoopy, Donald, Tigger, and what they did is that they differentiated. She did an assessment the day before, and she found that students still had difficulties. So she differentiated the lesson for that particular day. And for these two groups, which were the weaker groups, she wanted to do the prince and the pauper, and she was going to be with them. And this group, the Donald group, she gave them assignment, assessment, some assignment to stretch them. But for the Tigger, who are the high progress students. Because you cannot, if you don't look after the high progress students, they're gonna be bored. So what she did was that she gave them more work to do, right? So let's watch this video, okay? So you can see the teacher, if I'm not wrong, there were 30 students in that class, Pinebury Tree. So the teacher is with the student, teaching them within the class. The teacher's classroom, TI fails if classroom management, you don't have the skill of classroom management. So you have to have that skill. So this is one of the groups, and this is the high progress group. They're doing Venn diagram. They are looking, see at the levels here, they are supposed to do all the levels here. They are answering the questions in those levels, and the teacher has given them the work to do. And they are doing, and they are students Surprisingly, who are even faster, they finished their work. And they are allowed to read. So they continue, they extend the learning, all right? Teacher doesn't stop them and tells them what to do. So they are quietly doing their work. And then there is the other group, which is the middle progress group. And they are given, last they're just doing the Venn diagram and selecting lists of words, all right, for vocab. But in this class, they have one student that is a difficult student. So the student prefers to be alone by herself. So they allow it, they respect it. But after a while, peer pressure will pull the kid across. So if you see, they are doing their work, and because she has great classroom management skills, she could do three lessons in one class. And this is how differentiation is done. An extension. All right, and you see this kid? She's alone by herself. She didn't want to do, didn't want to be with the group. All right. Another thing that is also good to check whether your students are doing well, you want to do instant work, you ask them a question. Oops, 
All oh, right, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you Kahoot's and looks like my video has disappeared. Kahoot's is a technology where you can get instant response from the student using IT. All right, I'm sorry about that. But anyone who wants to see it, we can show it to you. We are, we are here the next few days. Oh, it's here. Okay. So this is a classroom where the teacher asks a question and it's uh, accounts. Okay, and she's asking a question. And students are using Kahoot's and they are putting it, they are allowed to use their handphone only for certain, uh, for such uh, assessments. So the students are answering the question and they are putting the answer in the Kahoot's, it's collecting the data. They are given multiple choice responses, they are choosing which is correct. And students are using their own phone. And straight away they got the response whether they got it right and it shows one student got it right or oh in fact one student got it three students got it wrong and one stu and 12 students got it right They have to optimize learning for self-directed learning as we described earlier. And we always use the framework of Dylan Williams assessment for learning and we use the John Maxwell framework. So this is what Dylan Williams says. If you are serious about raising student achievement, you have to change what happens in the classroom. So you have to go into the classroom, right? So he has five key principles for keeping learning on track. So let's go through the first one very quickly and I'll round up soon, okay? So clarifying and understanding learning intentions and criteria for success. This is crucial. When you go into the classroom, you've got to tell the students, what are you learning today? What are your look for? What are your success criteria? And when the end of the lesson, the student knows what they have to learn and what they didn't learn, they know it themselves. So this is leading them to self-directed learning. So we are not saying learning intentions are different from learning objectives. Learning objectives are totally different, all right? That's for the teacher, all right? Then comes engineering effective discussion, questions, and tasks that elicit evidence of learning. So even for physical education, our teachers have to, after they have done, you know, PE, Physical education is such an active session, but even then, they will have to do a debrief to get the students to talk to each other. So if you look at this PE lesson, you can see that the teacher has asked the question and the students are asked to discuss it so that the learning is concretized, so that the learning seals the learning, all right? And at the same time, the teacher can find out what is it that went wrong, what I have to do in my lesson tomorrow to correct it, because he will question them. And it's physical education, you know, so that the students know the rules. The other thing is providing feedback that moves the learners forward. Let me let you hear this because this is student giving feedback. There's two components, teacher giving feedback, student giving feedback, and this is student giving feedback. Let me just bring it up. The year mankind landed on the moon. For me, a far more momentous occasion occurred. My father was born. Ruben Pupalingam was born on 19th August 1969. He was born in Malacca General Hospital. However, his birth was just as tenuous as men's mission. So, students reading his as composition. His was a plus, See how his, his fellow was friends. A minus, a phenomenon known as recess isoimmunization occurred. Now, is it necessary to go into detail what your father So, the friends are did? editing the composition. More relation to how this like how your parents, the parents' parents' lifestyle What he could have done better, they are sharing and, with um, him. Since your father is how many years old? Uh, 40 plus? Do you need to have such a big, uh, such one and a half page description of, of his blood? But it's fine. No, I think we're going to shorten it a bit. And, like, don't need to talk so much about their work, but you can talk about how you affect them. Like, you say they are devout Hindus, so you can see what your father did. Like, like did he like, go to the temple? So, after.
after doing that, they write in a list and the teacher looks at it and see whether the students are giving correct feedback because the people who give peer feedback are the people who are learning the most. They are understanding what they need to have. So when they have to write the composition, they will not make the same mistake. All right? And there is, a, uh, I will skip, because due to time, I will move on. So the last thing you have to do is active, activating students at, as instructional resources for each other. All right? So, and activating students as owners of their own learning. So effective feedback is basically providing feedback that moves the learners forward, all right? I'm going to skip this because I think time is essence now. So what is feedback? So feedback is information about how we are doing in our efforts to reach a goal. So if you want to know who's the guru, please, you can go and Google him. He's really brilliant. He's John Hattie, four level of feedback, all right? And this is his four levels. And when we conduct such workshops, we actually take uh, about two to, we take about one to two days to conduct this workshop. So it really brings the student from task feedback all the way to becoming self-directed. So, can I just ask you all to read what's on the screen? Please, try to read it, if you can. Read it aloud, if you can. We should... We should not... Try, try. I'm just going to finish in a minute. So let's read it together aloud, okay? We should not teach students to just memorize what we teach. Okay, so basically, if suppose you're teaching something that doesn't make sense, and for the students, they just cannot make sense out of it. So you will have to, to assessment of learning is to check that they have learned and make meaning and sense to their learning. Thank you very much for being a great audience. Shall I just remove mine? Okay. This is just to sum up all that Nirmala just said. And uh, the foremost among them is uh, joy for learning and to be lifelong learners. Leadership should embrace all sections. That's very important. And of course, uh, if, if you have the triangle, you have the three corners, curriculum, pedagogy, and assessments. And assessments are very the strongest element. While it is not too much effort should not be put on assessment like we have teaching to testing all the time. It is that assessment not of learning, but for learning, to adapt our teaching accordingly, to move forward, and that is what is, you know, that, that is the essence of this whole lecture. I mean, that is self-driven, how you motivate students, adapt lesson, uh, your lesson plan, and move forward, and that's formative, and that leads to self-driven, uh, self-assessment, you know. Because if you notice that self-assessment is most uh, difficult because the student has to do it himself, be enough motivated, and teacher acts as a facilitator, steps backwards, because the student is in the for, uh, forefront, and they have to find their own way. And that makes learning truly fun. And then there is skill, uh, skillful learning, learning some skill for life, which we uh, in India at the moment are also going through skill-based learning. Teach less, learn uh, more, and collaboration, which is of course most important, one of the uh, Kagan structures, and also what leads to group learning and how interactive learning pr promotes learning. 
And of course, teachers' role with all the technology uh, cannot be ever ruled out. Uh, these are some of the things. Feedback is very important, identifying learning gaps, differentiated teaching to reach out to every student in the classroom is very, very important. No class can be good. I mean, even in UAE, when I, when I look at classrooms or audit classrooms, no, t uh, no uh, school is good unless it is inclusive. So one has to have differentiation there. And of course, um, neither speaker to look at, you can use stuff like this. That's about all in the net chart. F feedback, the one important point, of course, was that uh, feedback is very important. Accordingly, one has to moderate one's lesson. Feedback the from, idea here, from the, the teacher to students. To feedback from connect. the students to what the teachers. What does this mean? Well, most Thank people you. learning a second language sort of yes. take the mother tongue words and the target words. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Nirmala. Thank you. In a nutshell. Really inefficient. What you need to do. You said so many things. Uh, well, we'll have the question answer session once all the speakers are through with their uh, presentation. Yeah. So what you do is you go into shall that I imagery and all of that memory, I'll just, and you come out with another. Shall I switch off that? My next uh, introduction for the next speaker is very brief, uh, yeah. and it's all comprehensive, and each one of us can identify with that. When I asked her, "How do you want to be introduced?" she said, really good "A teacher." And that's what we all are, educators, teachers. And she says, I'm a creative teacher. When I ask, please say something more, she says, I'm a creative teacher. So we have here before uh, all of you, uh, Stella Fernandez, who will be talking about uh, beyond classroom and the role of a teacher today. Thank you. OK. Okay, I've been told to specially highlight that she's been co uh, she has received the President's Award for being the most innovative teacher. So we can give her a big hand. Thank you.